Cool. Hello, everyone. Okay. Uh, welcome to week, uh, what is this? Week nine of your OLS 6 uh, course. Um, just a very gentle reminder that there is a code of conduct and community participation guidelines that we all adhere to whilst we're on this call, whilst we're engaging with OLS. Um, basic idea, just be respectful of one another, be kind to one another. There is a lot more detail in there, and you can find that on line 57 in the etherpad, which is linked in the chat. Um, if you do experience or witness any unacceptable behavior or have any other concerns, please report it by contacting the organizers via team at openlifesite.org. Org, um, and to report an issue involving one of the organizers themselves, you can uh, email one of the others. So that's uh, Berenice, Malvika, Emmy, or Yo. Um, there is an Otter AI transcript, which you can follow, uh, which you can open following the link that I've also put in the chat in the etherpad. It's on line 60. Um, and finally, welcome to week nine of your OLS 6 course. Today we're discussing open leadership, academia, industry and beyond. Uh, we'll have three wonderful speakers, Jafsia, uh, Daniela and Olia. Um, during each talk, you are welcome to share your questions and comments for each within the etherpad. Um, and without further ado, Let's begin with Jafsia. You are first. Do you have a screen to share? Uh, do you want to test that quickly? Yes, I have a screen to share. I have my presentation. So. Super. Um, I'll, I'll try and keep time within 25 minutes each so we don't go to um, too, uh, over time. Um, okay. Jafsia, when you're ready, uh, please take it away. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. So the topic I'm going to present today is uh, entitled Academic Leadership a group of project leaders. So yeah, it's a surprise for me because uh, I will address an audience of rock star in academic leadership. I'm talking about the Amazons of the OLS organizing committee. I'm thinking of you and his team and her team, sorry. And uh, My name is uh, Josia Elise. I'm a data scientist at Mboa Lab in Yaoundé, Cameroon. So Mboa Lab is an open space and an open community. So I have structured the presentation into four points. The first point we will talk about leadership. The second one will be about academic leadership. Then we talk about group of project leaders. And at the end, I will take you through my path to academic leadership. So let's start with what is leadership. So most of the time, Leadership is defined as the action of leading a group of people or an organization. Another definition is uh, that leadership is about taking risk and challenging the status quo. A third definition is uh, leadership is the potential to influence behavior of others. So, from the three definitions, we will say that leadership is necessary for every work done by a group of person. So we have characteristic um, different styles of leadership, but I'm not going to 
to present them here because there is a lot of literature about leadership styles. What is academic leadership? Academic leadership is the system of interdependent elements that together allow a provider to achieve or at least support and monitor its intended academic outcomes. Uh, we will go deep into the academic leadership when I will take you through my path for academic leadership. So what's the distinction between a group of uh, project leaders? Here we have the distinction. A project leader is, is the one who leads a world project, which contain multiple tasks. A project leader will do the people management activities. Although a group leader will lead a group within the project, then the team will be created based on related tasks within the project. As an example, a project leader will lead maybe for a world multimedia project, and the group leader will lead a team that will work on audio player or the video player, and both teams are formed under the multimedia project. So the project leader is in the top, and then we have the group, various group leaders. What is the effective academic leadership profile? For the academic leadership profile, we have the academic capacity. We have the leadership capacity. We have the leadership styles. And we have personal and interpersonal capacities. So it means that academic leadership is about aptitude like research, credibility, resource acquisition, but also about attitude, communication skills, self-regulation, commitment, and deceitfulness. So now I will take you through my path to academic leadership at uh, the Mboa Lab. So I, I joined the Mboa Lab with uh, a background in physics to work on AI. And uh, the founder who is Dr. Toma asked me to join the team. And it was uh, a new experience for me. So what I went through I started by tailoring my ideas and my goals individually. So for it is mainly individual. The path to academic leadership will differ from some, somebody to the other, but there are some fundamental truths that are applicable to everyone. So I have to develop my research skills, particularly my writing skills, to work on how I will manage my time. And I have to go for mentorship. And thanks to OLS for that. I also have to develop an individual career plan. Next, I learned to be a people person because most of the time I'm involved in teams, I'm working with teams. And with the teams, we have a lot of projects. Another thing that I learned is to accept feedback even if they are tough. So if 
you want someone that will tell you that you are good at everything, you are strong, you are beautiful. I, I think the best place to stay is to go to your mom's house. Uh, so it's not uh, looking for mentors or advisors. And you can have a big project, but if you don't have the scale that go with, it's a complete waste of time. So uh, it is just like a farmer who is going to the farm without a cutlass, okay? There is also another attitude is to be flexible. So I, I remember when I was in the US for my Fulbright program, uh, the other fellows were complaining because we didn't have a, a timetable scheduled. So we were receiving at 4 a.m., we were receiving this cordial for the day. So we were not prepared for that. We used to have, when I, I was living in Africa, we used to have our timetable for the whole year. So the others were complaining, but uh, for me, it was just natural uh, because in the uh, in, in US, the, the, particularly in the Nevada, the, the weather was very crazy. So sometimes we have to be flexible in, uh, in our path to academic leadership. So what are the fundamental truths that uh, I was talking about? The fundamental truths are passion. So if you are not passionate about what you want to achieve, you can't achieve it. It's just like taking a house to the water and wanting to force the horse to drink the water. It's not possible. In Africa, we used to say, you can close someone's eyes, but you cannot force him to sleep. So you need passion uh, to your path, to, to your path to academic leadership. Then also another fundamental truth is to focus to solve important problems. So to, to answer questions that, that will impact. And another thing uh, I learned is that the path to academic leadership is not a sprint, it is a marathon. And so we need two, two main skills, persistence and perseverance. Uh, we need to accept rejection. So when we write grants, our proposal will be rejected. Uh, we, we don't have to feel frustrated, but we, we need to consider it as um, a booster to improve ourselves and to improve our writing skills, our manner of of writing proposals. And there is a, a quote from Tim Nocti that said, hard work will always be talent when talent doesn't work hard. So we, we also need to work hard. Time is the most valuable asset we should use. So we have, it's the most valuable asset we have. We, we should use it very wisely. That uh, is very important. And we should avoid distraction. There is uh, those weapons of mass distraction. Uh, we, we should avoid distraction. We should be focused on what we want to achieve. But the path to academia leadership is not uh, just like a straight line, but there are also challenges. And the challenges uh, most of the time due to the fact that we are overly ambitious. So we have to be, our ambition should be balanced. 
we are overly ambitious. And maybe another challenge will arise when we are using unrealistic timeline for our individual development plan. And also sometimes when there is too much coursework, uh, this will be very challenging. So this is uh, what I've prepared today. I think I've not extrapolated the time to 25 minutes. So thank you, merci. Uh, my name is Jeff Elize. You can reach me through my regular email, jeffselize at gmail.com. Thank you once again. Thank you, Jeff, yeah, that was excellent. Um, lots of thank yous and great feedback through the uh, chats and the uh, etherpad. Jeff, yeah, if you could actually let's let's um, stick to questions and see if if there are questions related to the uh, PowerPoint presentation. If there are any questions that might require a slide, if these can, if you want to, if people would raise their hand and share these questions now. If there are no questions about the slides we can stop sharing the screen. How does that sound? Um, any questions that relate with the slides at all? The small group, you can unmute if you want. It's now, so if it's all right, I will ask a question. Go for it. Thank you. Um, I just wondered, you obviously this talk is about leadership and I just, I just wonder if obviously for, for those of us who aren't necessarily in leadership positions, I just I really loved hearing you talk about, you know, how important it is to surround yourself with people who are, you know, able to challenge you constructively for the purpose of the work and, you know, being able to sort of, you know, really find a good way forward. Um, and I suppose I was wondering if you had any um, tips or guidance or, you know, sort of insights that you could share for people who say, you know, are maybe working with leadership that isn't always open to that kind of you know feedback and and critique and slight challenging you know even if it's kind of done in the most respectful way um do you have any sort of insights or advice that you could give people um in terms of like how to sort of deal and manage you know not necessarily having a, a leadership that that is open to that kind of critical feedback so thank you mary uh, the thing is that no one loves critics. That's uh, the human nature. So <laughs> yeah. no one's no, no one. And I think it is. It's not an aptitude. It's not just like mathematics, learning mathematics, calculus, and coding. It's an attitude, and we have to cope with that. We have to to accept it. I think. We have to accept that we need people to challenge us. We need people to, we need to go out of our comfort zone. Yeah. Because keeping asking for good feedback is just like staying in your comfort zone. And if you are not challenging yourself, you will keep and stay there when the others will move forward. So I think it's an attitude and we, we, we need to cope with that. We, we need to accept that sometimes if we need help, uh, help we, from others or advice from others, we, even when they are tough, we need to accept it. It's a, a mental preparation for me. Mm. You have to mentally prepare yourself. That's a... I don't know. I don't have a magic formula or a tip for that. I think it's just a mental preparation. Mm. Yeah, I definitely appreciate what you're saying there. Um, it's just, it, yeah, it's it's tricky to sort of know if, um, you know, how to. I think Yo has put a comment in the chat, <laughs> which is kind of what I was uh, along the lines of sort of thinking. You know, sometimes leadership you know, doesn't necessarily always have that attitude that you're sort of talking about is so important. And I think 
absolutely recognize that that is an important part of leadership having that right attitude but sometimes it's not always there so you know how to sort of really work with that sometimes and um when you're not in a leadership position yourself to be able to emulate that and sort of demonstrate that yourself um yeah it's it's tricky to know how to to sort of work with that effectively i suppose is what i'm saying um so whether you've got any advice from being on the other side maybe at some point in your career path um but yeah there's no there's no magic answer i'm sure <laughs> yeah exactly thank you thank you very much thank you so, so much before we get to our next question jeff could you stop sharing your screen okay thank you yeah um and then we're all back here we are um there are a few more questions in the etherpad i'll go uh, through them in order the first one so during your undergrad physics training did you have any formal course or training that involved personal skills so training i imagine if if the person who wrote that question wants to clarify anything at all yeah oh. sorry that was me <laughs> no i if you yeah like i wonder if um, as part of the physics uh, career whatever um in university you had a course on i don't know like uh, uh, skills like uh, interpersonal skills and relationship skills is, is that part of the universe in that <laughs> sort of uh, physics department or faculty or whatever or or not at all mm. Mm, no, uh, in our universities here in Cameroon, we don't have uh, courses on interpersonal skills. We we mostly rely we mostly rely on our families and particularly on our mothers to to teach us orally those kinds of of attitudes or to 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 and those kinds of behaviors. So. And most of the time in my undergraduate studies in the university, we were just just doing physics and mathematics, physics, mathematics, and theoretical computer science. So no soft skills, interpersonal skills. It's uh, after my master degree that I've started looking for books on interpersonal skills and soft skills, and I started reading them on psychology and, and mindset and things like that. I, I still like the implication of the first part of your answer. We need to have a theory about the influence of mothers on the culture of science. Sorry, that was a silly joke. Um, there's another question. Um, are you still involved with the university where you did your undergrad studies? Um, uh, well, I guess this is this has been answered. D do they tackle issues of leadership somehow? Um, but this might be interesting as a question from your master's degree and beyond. Is this something that is tackled at university, or is it you needing to proactively look for that literature? Oh, this. Uh... Can you come again with the question, please? Sure. Um, so do you tackle issues of leadership, questions of leadership through the structures at university? So are there courses, are there options to learn more about leadership? Or is it something that is that you need to proactively look for? I think there are things uh, they were, they, they were, I would just need to proactively look for them. Uh, I was just like, maybe leadership was just like a vague and a bizarre term for me. I was just looking for school. I was in the same university, but going to school in three different colleges. I was a student in the higher teachers training college. I was a student uh, in the faculty of science doing physics there, doing physics in the higher teachers training college. I was also a student in the 
Polytechnic Institute doing an NBA there. So I was just look, I, I was just learning, 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 learning. When uh, something was maybe it strange for me, I, I was just wanting to go and learn what it is. That's what uh, I did. In, in one year and a half, I, I, I was a student in three different master degrees. So I, I was just, it was just like, it came, it, come, it came to me naturally. I was also living with my junior brothers. So, uh, and I, I have to, I was just like a role model for them. So I, I started thinking that if I'm, not behaving in a good term, they will also copy the bad things that I'm, I'm doing. And I, I, this one, this started when I, the kind of music I was, I, I was listening to. All my junior brothers are release. Uh, they don't listening. They just listen to hip hop, U.S. hip hop music because I used to listen to hip hop music, and I have to change it so that. And most of them today. When I ask him, them they say they want to become DJs because they learn they were listening music from me. I, I have and I, I have to stop it. I, I, I become I, I started realizing that my behavior is influencing others. So that's how I've started changing in changing my behavior so as to influence them. And now they are. They have another other career in mind. They want to become engineers, pilots, and, and things like that. <laughs> okay. No, I love that. There's there's a moment in your life where you realize, oh, I actually have influence and should maybe think yeah. about what music I play or, or how I yeah behave around others. Um there is a final question. I think it's very, um, it, we've already touched on it, but I'll read it out um, in case you have any final thoughts. Do you think you develop self-leadership? So do you think you develop through reflections on how you learn to manage your own time, attention and direction? And, and that's what helps you to work with others. So yes. do you think you, yeah, you develop yes. self-leadership? Self self leadership, yes. It was um, it, it was when I realized that I, I'm influencing others that I, I I decided maybe to to change to change my manner to behave. Starting with my my junior brothers at home, and then outside. So in my community, I, I used to help students when they have difficulty in STEAM. So helping them, them in mathematics, physics. And most of the time they are looking at me, they rely on me. So uh, I decided to change everything. The manner with which I used to wear clothes, the type of clothes, the time of words I'm using, uh, the term, the, the words that I'm using to teach them. Everything, uh, I think in a lapse of uh, maybe three months, I changed everything. So, because I realized that I'm, I'm influencing others, not just my junior brothers, my other people in my communities, even some friends. So uh, that's when I started to reading, I started reading books about growth mindset, about interpersonal skills, and uh, it changed everything for me. And, and also another thing that I, I, again, reading those books is uh, self-confidence, self-confidence, self-esteem. self, -confidence, self, -esteem, self -esteem, so, and uh, everything went smoothly when, when I realized that. Amazing, thank you so much. Another uh, one final silent, round of applause from from the audience um thank you Jafsia, for your time and and for this great talk um shall we move on to the next speaker we have uh daniela duca um 
I see you're already there. Would you like to share your screen? And take it away when you can. Can you see mm. my screen, hear yeah. me? Yeah. yeah. Super. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, yeah. So hi everyone. Thanks for thanks for having me. And um, I mean, it's, it's great to follow such an amazing talk on, on leadership. Uh, I will focus on some of the things that actually Jafsia mentioned. So it's great. <laughs> um, uh, so my presentation mostly around um, open secrets, so things that everyone knows, um, and how how to how I've been finding joy in my in my work. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, I'm Daniela, um, and I had to find a picture with with sun because it's pretty bad and raining in London. <laughs> Um, I'm currently the head of product innovation at Sage, um, but I'm also an artist and I also do some uh, consultancy on innovation. Um, and I'm also uh, co-leading one of the working groups at the Research um, Software Funders Forum. So um, just kind of thinking about my life and you you did ask what, what, what did you imagine being? <laughs> At five, the icebreaker at five, and when when I was uh, in kindergarten, and and thought about what I wanted to be when I uh, grew up, my mind would simply scroll through uh, kind of learned professions, right? So teacher, doctor, lawyer, banker, things that kind of come up in you know books. <laughs> Um, and uh, but very soon I, I realized that actually I, I didn't really know what that meant and um, I only loved doing what I thought I liked in the moment. So I uh, grew up in, in Moldova and Moldova is, uh, as, as it was kind of falling out of the Soviet Union, the, the school system was pretty intense so everyone had to learn everything whether you liked it or not there were no no such things as electives uh, and what I realized is oh my god I was such a geek I really loved learning I was so obsessed with you know, finding new information that I even managed to skip some some of the grades and um, at that point I was really out of my comfort zone but I quite I quite liked it. And so what I decided from that point on is that every decision I would make um, in my career would have to take me to a place where I've never been before um, because I really wanted to keep learning. So um, I, I then got a scholarship and I went to um, a boarding school called United World College in Italy. Um, there I kind of picked up German <laughs> and then I accidentally ended up in, in the US. Um, and that, that was kind of bef before um, Google Maps had everything, right? So I had no idea where Lafayette College was. <laughs> I knew it was somewhere in Americas. Um, and so there I was working towards um, a bachelor's in biochemistry. And um, I was the skills I was learning were primarily analytical, problem solving, and I was feeling too comfortable. And I thought that I, I, I needed to do something else. And what was it that I was missing was understanding society. Um, and so, I mean, I love that you asked uh, if there was a, a course on, on skills and learning about leadership in, in a physics program, like there was no such thing in a biochemistry program. So I was like, well, I need to find something. And what I thought was the closest thing was economics. <laughs> um, and so while I was, uh, I, I added this as a second degree and um, I did a study abroad and I became really fascinated with development economics. So how developing countries were, were growing and why it was different from say something like the, the West. Um, and that brought me to, to do a master's in development studies. And this is what, why I came to, to the UK. Um, the, the not, not so, okay, so uh, sorry, I'm not like UK London, I guess. Um, so what, what was happening when I started looking for a job is the middle of the financial crisis. Uh, and so it's probably quite similar to how people are looking for jobs right now. I mean, I was going through about 300 applications per month and, um, the, the only jobs that would take me were very niche areas. Um, so I did, I did work in ESG, so environmental social governance, which now is at the core of all the investment strategies. But at that point, 
what I was trying to do is convince people that they needed to think about um, environmental and social um, aspects when they when they invest. And so then I was working within um, the, the financial technology sector, and um, I, um, I I kind of like got into the whole like CFA path and and learning about that. Um, and what I did, and at the same time, I, I was actually also doing my, my PhD in innovation management. But And so all in all, what I was realizing is that um, I, I wasn't really loving so much the, the content that I was learning. I was loving the learning process itself. And, um, and when I thought, well, what, where, where is learning center stage? And that was academia. And that's how I started thinking, well, what, what type of jobs are there in academia? So I started working at, at GISC um, and then moved uh, on to Sage Publishing and the, the kind of the thread throughout these academically adjacent jobs um, has really been research software and, um, I, I would really like to believe that the whole thing culminated with um, a, a, a white paper that um, I wrote with uh, my colleague Katie Metzler, reviewing the ecosystem of technologies uh, for social science research. And so uh, we did that back in 2019, and <clears throat> I've been tracking more than 500 tools and software at that time, mostly used by social scientists, um, finding them through word of mouth or from papers or from wherever I could see, like, or I could see a signal of a social science researcher's researcher using that that type of software. Um, and so there was a trend that that was uh, confirmed through this uh, little analysis, which was that um, half of the tools were um, still developed by private companies, as you would expect, that, but the other half were built within universities. A lot of them were side projects um, maintained by communities of researchers, um, an emerging number of consortia uh, of universities running them. Um, and everyone would develop. So whether they were free or commercial, everyone would be developing open source. Um, and, and that was, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and um, at the time, um, uh, the, the uh, like two uh, close to 300 of the tools were free. And so that's uh, more than half. And there were still some tools that were being used from the 60s, <laughs> which that, really was super impressive um, and so where where we could find what the, the other exercise we tried to do is understand who are the founding teams and so where we could find the data what we did establish is that there was very little um, diversity in the um, um, in, in the teams uh, so I mean, my assumption was that maybe that would, was making it harder to come up with those types of innovations that were at, at the intersection. Uh, we found that only about 80 of the tools out of the 452 teams that we, we were able to find data for had women. Um, so that was about 15%. And uh, 24 um, uh, software had single women founders. And that was compared to about 236 for, for men. So we we're like, well, something had to be done. We still have no idea what. <laughs> and the other aspect of it uh, that I've uh, looked into were um, the successful tools. So the tools that were successful, what were the peculiarities or maybe some trends or themes? What was working for them? So almost always, whether they're free, uh, open source or commercial, they almost always have one person in the team that is fully dedicated to working on that sustainability aspect. So the for the free tools, it was around reaching out to different organizations like uh, CZI, Omidia, or Mellon Foundation to raise funds. Um, and some of them had raised up to 6 million across several years. Uh, which um, quite impressive. Um, on the commercial tools, you know, they they have uh, business people and their teams were raising funds from venture capitalists. So mostly because um, they were working with big brand clients, and so that kind of made them attractive to to VCs. So through through this work and and um, um, another uh, aspect of my job, which is running the Sage Concept Grants. Uh, for research software, we're running them every year, small seed grants for anyone who's developing uh, any kind of software that social science researchers would use. 
um, we I, I kind of got involved with the software um, uh, research founders uh, forum um, and Polydean, one of the working groups that is investigating uh, different ways um, that we can do, um, we can go for to facilitate the sustainability of research software. So um, in, in, in summary, uh, what for me, what were the these open secrets that helped me find the type of jobs that, that I I love and doing the work that I love is uh, always learning and learning obsessively and looking what is it that I'm missing um, and how can I kind of complement or fulfill that um, and and sort of always also getting out of my comfort zone. So as soon as I get too comfortable looking for something and looking for something else that I've never been, never learned or never thought of. Um, yeah, and that's that's me. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, silent round of applause as we have on Zoom usually. Um, like before, I'll take first any questions that might have to do with the slides. So we can keep the slides up for a moment. If anyone has a question about the slides, please raise your hand. We'll put you first. Otherwise, we'll go to uh, questions in the etherpad. I'll give you a few seconds to gather your thoughts. A few seconds have passed. If there are no questions about the about the slides, Daniela, could you stop sharing the screen? Amazing, thank you. Here we are. Um, does anyone have any questions they'd like to raise? I'm just getting the ones that are already in the ether pad. Okay, I'll ask those. Um, so I think this one is from is from Yo, and I have the same question. What topics does one focus on for a PhD in innovation management? Yeah, good question. So uh, I had to skip some some bits, but um, one of my the small jobs that I did was a policy analyst, and so I was working with Will Hutton, um, and I was looking at innovation within um, NHS and also within established companies. So the idea there it was a think tank, so we were trying to understand what's go like where most jobs you know was financial after financial crisis. So where most jobs are created what kind of policies would um, encourage um, entrepreneurship. And so one of the findings was around um, this idea of intrapreneurship. Um, I, and it's about like, how do you encourage um, employees within organizations to come up with new ideas and to kind of promote those within a company. And so um, that was the topic that I continued. Um, and I think when when I when I speak with many people that are only starting their PhD, what I tell them that uh, my experience is, is that I already knew what I wanted to do, and I know that's really hard often. And but I I I because I already knew because I had already done a lot of literature review before starting the PhD. It kind of it was um, it was I, I would think it was easier than than if I didn't than if I was looking for a topic. And so um, in my PhD, I was looking at how uh, companies are um, engaging employees to, to become more innovative or to come up with new product ideas. Um, and um, why I, I, I did it back home. And so um, I kind of used that, that thing that I was interested in development, uh, development studies. And so how is that, how is it different in companies that are in third world countries, um, which Moldova is compared to what's happening, let's say in the UK or in the States or in other um, uh, more advanced economies. Um, and then, um, yeah, and, and then my job right now is essentially that. So I do, I work on new products within at, at Sage. Oh, yo, go for it. Thanks. So, um, Daniela, it's really, really interesting just listening to you talk about this um, and about your research and what you're doing at the moment. Um, but one thing that I've found, and this is anecdotal, but 
that very often I've, it's impossible to innovate within a company or within an organization and that you have to leave to get what you want done. So I'm very curious what your findings were. Like, did because my, my experience is that corporation, corporates just push down innovation. We don't want it. We don't want to hear it. We say we do, but we don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's very different and it varies. I agree with you, Yo. So it depends on the company. Um, what most so most research shows that actually where innovation is incremental, but incremental in the sense that the, um, let's say if you are coming up with a new product, um, there are multiple aspects to that product. So there is how do you sell it? Um, there's what's, you know, what are the revenue models, who the customers are, what the technology is. And so um, often the, the type of innovations that companies tend to um, uh, refuse are where there is something new in, in all of those aspects. And research shows that when companies are trying to do that, um, established companies, they're not really managing it because they're not as smooth as, let's say, a startup that can nimbly work through those um, and build all of those aspects. And so where companies do succeed is where some of those aspects um, can be built upon from within the company itself. So let's say if you're working on a new product for the same customer base or that can be sold through the same sales channels or that has a similar business model to what you have, then you might only be developing the technology. Or maybe you you already have the, the technology and you're selling it to a customer base for a particular problem, but you're finding, well, actually this could be also sold to some, some other industry or in some other form. And then so then what you're doing, you're only focusing on building those aspects. And so in, in the sense, you, you, you can be better than a startup because you already have something to start with. And so you're not being slowed down by all of the processes, but actually those processes are, are helping you get, get faster and, and release that product faster. Thank you. That makes so much sense. <laughs> but, you know, nobody always knows whether, like, whether this is really new for the company or uh, really like something that the company cannot do. So sometimes things that do succeed outside, so like that are pivoted and, you know, they go like people that leave the company to set up their own. It, we, we don't know counterfactuals, right? So it's possible that if, if the company tried to develop that product, maybe it wouldn't have succeeded either. Only certain types of innovation for big companies then. Um, there is another question in the etherpad. So, uh, so many questions. I'll choose one. I'm reading, I'm reading verbatim. Um, do you think there is more and more integration of social sciences and business, public or private management? And if so, uh, what has been instrumental for that? So does it mean if research in the social sciences is being applied back into into business and management um i you know i i don't know um i i do so when i was um uh, kind of going through the literature for my uh, for my phd what i was finding is that often the type of research that's done on management and on innovation is often things that have already happened. So that some companies have already done because uh, researchers are looking well, are there any trends across the companies that are succeeding or that are failing and so on. So um, I think the, 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 um, the, 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 the kind of the process or the instruments for those types of ideas and, and uh, theories to go back into into business is either you have to have managers that are keen and looking out for this th this type of research um, or um, you kind of wait for I don't know the um, nonfiction books uh, from either academics or journalists to come up often they're done in a way that maybe is not depicting exactly what that research has found or um, things like that I mean th there is a maybe maybe completely unrelated but there is one amazing book and i'll um i'll put the link in there um it's about a new theory of of uh, management and it's it's essentially how um uh, like things like the the um 
a series from from essentially from management have been passed on uh, into into the public space through consultancies into public companies through consultancies uh, but essentially been simplified um, and sort of the complexities of how organizations work is not exactly well um, uh, well depicted um, sorry I, I can get more detail it's a lot I mean I studied philosophy of the social sciences, so I'd like to have a go at that one, but we don't have time. Um, we have five more minutes. I'll go through questions as they've come in chronologically, and the next one is still under etherpad. Um, and, and this one might be somewhat related in the chat as well. Can you, can you share any reading lists you might have? Um, so that might be a task to, if you have time sometime during the day or the week or the month, uh, something to share. Sure, um, yeah. And and another question is how does innovation management intersect with bibliometrics or scientometrics, and how can we organize ourselves to enable future research in these areas? Wow, um, that's that's a tough question. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I I have to think about this. I don't I don't really have an answer right now. So. Um, I mean, I guess though the, I, I could say one major thing which I found um, is that being within this uh, space does require to be really up to date with everything that's happening. So if you are working in, in innovation or if you are trying to come up with new ideas, um, it's really like the only way you can do it is if you have a good understanding of what's going on. And the way to do that is essentially, you know, one is you look at the, the everything that's being written, but also follow um, any type of uh, scholarly communications. And so what, what uh, res researchers are working on not just papers that are being published. I mean, I do uh, love going to conferences. That's pretty much the the key way of finding out what's new and um, uh, you know, without waiting like two years <laughs> for the peer-reviewed articles to come up. Um, yeah, so I would say that is definitely one thing. There, there are. Um, a host of tools now that are being developed. So a lot of um, summarization tools and, and um, um, you know, scholarship being one of them that is all, that are becoming quite popular also with the, uh, with the, I would say the general public or professionals um, because it is quite, still quite hard uh, reading um, academic papers for maybe someone that hasn't really done a lot of um, university work. And so um, um, these type of summarization tools, they do kind of give lay summaries or um, they give an idea before you, you know, try to spend too much time working through the papers to realize is this something that I need or not. Um, so um, I, I would say, and, and there's also the other thing that I have noticed is um, a lot of uh, both publishers, but also other type of aggregators. So you think about lens.org as well, um, what, uh, uh, and Frontiers, um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to do topic summaries. So um, someone like an expert from the field trying to look into what's going on and kind of give you give you an overview so which is more accessible for for the general public um so yeah in terms of like really uh hardcore bibliometrics and scientometrics i i think it will take a while <laughs> before um before kind of managers or um people in the industry will really do this type of um or use this type of work or um, processes, yeah. Super, and I'll note we have one minute left and I don't want to eat too much into earliest time. Really quick question. I think I'm understanding it right. It's from Jafsia, it's in the chat. Actually, um, Daniela, take a look in the chat. There are great questions if you have time later. Um, but will you be presenting details about your last fellowship in the US at some point somewhere, maybe online, for example? Uh, no, that was... <laughs> Sorry, that oh, was my question for Japsia. Ah, okay, cool. I've got that all wrong. Um, 
in which case I've just ruined that last minute. But there is another question from Nikki. I'll just read it out. Interested in Yo's comments about having to leave an organization to affect innovation. I'd be interested to know how often somebody um, seen as influential leaves and comes back. Um, and if there are uh, diversity and inclusion issues um, around uh, when, when that does happen. Um, but again, because I read that first question wrong, I've eaten into your last minute. I'm sorry. Um, no worries. One final, uh, uh, sorry, Daniela, one final round of applause for Thank you. Daniela and what was excellent talk. Thank you so much for your time. And we'll go on to the last talk by um, Olya. Are you ready to share your yes. screen? Yes, hi. Yeah, I am. And um, yeah, I, I apologize. I didn't realize I needed to put it within the the slides uh, format of, uh, oh, well, uh, okay, sorry. Mine is just black and white, nothing special. So if you need me to send you the slides mm -hmm. in the necessary format, Give me five minutes. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'll <laughs> no, share I'm the not at all then. required. No worries. It's all fine. Thank you. We take all types of presentation. Okay, slides. awesome. Yeah. Then I'll share the screen. Um yeah, and I just wanted to say that um I think my talk today it's a bit differently shaped than the talk of previous speakers, maybe more to Daniela's side. I am not going to share with you any fundamental truths today. In fact, I don't believe that it exists at all. So today I'm just going to show you my path. And maybe um, it's like all the amazing things which I've learned and um, experienced, but please be aware of other things as well. So this is what I'm going to um, share with you today. So I was asked to do a post-academic career path and social entrepreneurship talk. And, um, oh, I need to start sharing first, sorry. Um, here we are. Um, yeah, so I decided to start with uh, telling you about my actual CV. So the one which is on the paper. So starting from my education, I started medical, um, I studied medicine in Moscow and I got my um, MD um, degree there. Um, I worked on my MD in the United States. The University of Pittsburgh. Then I moved to Berlin. I did my PhD there. <clears throat> and I also got a project management qualification uh, from one of the universities in Germany. And currently, uh, I'm going through the school which teaches uh, how to run social projects and nonprofits as well. So this is when it comes to my education. So um, when it comes to my actual CV, as in the things which bring me money, um, I did, I worked as a lab technician for, for some years, and then I worked in the lab in the US doing my MD, and then moving upwards uh, in the sort of uh, scientific uh, ladder, I did my um, uh, PhD lab work, um, and then in 2017, I defended and moved to, to do a postdoc to become a postdoctoral research. And then from then on, I started to not only do scientific work management, but also a scientific project management, including um, concept development, uh, initiation planning, performing, monitoring, all the collaboration management, and so on and so forth. And in parallel, I was asked by my community, sort of by, by my folks to maybe think of some community devoted to the analytical method we all use. It's called mass spectrometry. Um, and so I created Dresden mass spec community. Um, and from there in 2021, I moved to industry, to, to Switzerland. Um, and I just worked in a small startup as a manager. So not only project management, but also some part of product management, scientific writing. It was a very small company. So you're basically a one-man band in, in such, a, such a setting. And so in 2022, uh, in February, I came back to Germany and I currently work in a biotech company, which is called Lipotype as a scientific communications officer. So essentially what brings me money, what I do is that I create um, any sort of scientific content. 
including press releases, case studies, some sort of support uh, materials, social media outreach, and so on and so forth. And I'm also um, taking care of, um, from probably next year, more into creating the community when it comes to the, the product which uh, we create in, in our company. And so when it comes to the social work I did, it all started um, here in Max Planck Society, because when I was doing my 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 PhD, I struggled from mental health issues, and um, there was no support for for PhD students back then in in the in the university where I studied, or at least I was not aware of it. Um, and um, when I joined as a postdoc, of course, as a postdoc, you have a bit more leverage because your path is not dependent on one person anymore because you already have your PhD. So um, I realized that there is no support for PhD students whatsoever. So I decided that we need to create uh, a support system for PhD students in our institute. So um, not only there was no mental health support in general, there were no uh, small parts, for example, no mental health first aider program, no peer network devoted to mental health, no publicly available information or where to go to if you are in a crisis. And so I uh, wanted to address certain things and then certain things needed to be developed from the scratch or to create it. I tried to talk to the headquarters of Max Planck Society. It was absolutely zero success. Um, we, and as I realized a lot of people in parallel were doing the same things. We just were not aware of each other in different universities, institutes of Max Planck. And essentially one of the um, like big shots from Max Planck told me that you know, we cannot create a system like we cannot what, what I said, like, let's do mental health awareness talk twice a year in each institute. And he's like, do you know how many are there? And I said, like, around 85. And he's like, what we cannot make 85 lectures. It's too much of taking away the uh, at, an, at, the autonomy, autonomicity, I don't know, autonomy of the institutes. And like, we cannot co coordinate such a large project. So and I was thinking, like, we can send a person to a moon, but we cannot give 85 or 170 lectures per year. So essentially, uh, these initiatives were shut down and it was not only by me as I realized later. So I decided to move one step lower, several steps lower, and I, I managed to get a support from one of the directors and started to work on the questions. Um, essentially, the support from the directors. Uh, I was meeting one of the one of the supporters, which were absolutely fantastic. He's a he's a great director, and I'm so grateful to him. Um, I prepared like a two pager, and he was absolutely amazed. Said, "Oh, you know, um, like th th this is amazing, amazing what you have." Well, actually, I think this is this probably it was not the first meeting; it was probably the second meeting. So I think I initially started maybe in 2018. Um, and then eventually um, what we created was the whole uh, page on our intranet. Um, it uh, was uh, called Mental Health Initiative. And the things which were there uh, were um, all the resources I could put together with the support of the community. So let's say I sent an email saying, Hi, folks, do you uh, like have a good therapist I could suggest to others? Can you please let me know their their context and the languages they speak? Um, so we created the internal base uh, of data therapists. Uh, oh, sorry, in internal database of, of therapists. Uh, we created um, together with a burnout clinic in Dresden, of course, with the help of directorate. Uh, mental health first aider program. So it was a two or three days course. And then we created the whole uh, list of people who are mental health first aiders in the Institute. And um, eventually I wanted to uh, be uh, sort of to know what's going on in other institutes. So we'll send a couple of emails here and there. And we figured out that there were four people uh, in our institute, uh, sorry, in, in Max Planck Society who were having the same vision. So we created the whole Max Planck Society initiative. Absolutely peer to peer and grassroots initiative. So nothing which was ever and still not supported by, by the headquarters. 
Um, and what we did, we created uh, several ways to support each other. So my database, which I created for Dresden for therapists, we enlarged it for um, for um, um, sort of the, the, the mental health collective. Uh, of course, uh, it was all uh, peer supported. So whenever I left Max Planck, uh, it kind of, I think this particular dis database got dissolved. However, there are many things which are still maintained. So for example, the, the Twitter um, we still have and the, there's still some things running. So as a whole Max Planck Society initiative, we uh, created weekly tea time during isolation. So we were all getting together. It was a free space and safe space for everyone online. We just went through the whole isolation time, uh, having meetings and you know just being able to share uh, the things. So we published a couple of pieces, of course, not research articles, but rather like an overview articles on mental health. We provided the support and uh, we provided people with the list of actions on let's say someone needs a therapist they don't know where to start from so they dropped us an email and we created the whole guidelines for people in germany to find the therapy which would be fitting to them um we didn't really give up on trying to get the support from headquarters so far um things are on and off and we created mental health awareness week starting from 2019 um, um it became all max planck um thing and um what we did, we created the whole schedule of talks. Um, and um, from then, it's still going. So in 2019 and 20 and 21 and 22, um, interestingly enough, and I think this is a really good reasonable uh, metrics, is that in 2019, we calculated around 500 participants in the talks. For, for the whole week, of course. And in 2020, there was around 1,000 participants. And from 21 and 22, it's around 2,000 participants. So it seems like 2,000 per year per, per week is the amount we can reach without a headquarters support. And again, none of this work was paid. So it was all uh, exclusively volunteer work. Um, and um, I wanted to show you um, the... Um, I have opened here some some links. So basically, from from one small local events, uh, we have created the whole. This year, there was the whole schedule for uh, for the whole week, in in both German and English. Sometimes with subsequent translations, and we have managed to invite so many wonderful speakers. And again, we have delivered it to around two thousand people. Um, so this was a fantastic, fantastic event. Um, and um, actually, I'm just uh, very, very proud that I've, I've managed to be a part of it. So um, moving forward in 2019, when I created this peer network uh, in Max Planck Institute, I decided that um, I need to go and meet some hopefully like-minded people to see how they're organizing their own things in their institutes. And in 2019, there was a conference which was called I Scientist in Berlin. And it was a conference and still is a conference about non-academical, um, so non-academic issues in academia. And in 2019, they had the whole panel uh, about academic mental health. And uh, we decided to get together with other people and uh, sort of create um, a, um, well, at least that was my uh, vision that I wanted to create guidelines for creating some peer networks like the one I created, so people wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. And so we got together and decided to, um, you know, create something to support academics globally. And we created Dragonfly Mental Health. Um, so um, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders. Now I run the ambassador program and uh, the European direction in, um, in Dragonfly. And essentially, uh, we got our nonprofit status in 2020. And um, at this very moment, we're nearly 350 volunteers. Uh, we're exclusively created by academics, for academics, and sometimes we also deliver talks to uh, and programs to academia adjacent industry, some biotechs, for example. And what we do, 
as a team, we take care of the education. So on campus programs, we deliver customized education, skill training, and some anti-stigma strategy and support. We take care of the community building. Uh, it's similar to what we created with uh, within the uh, Max Planck Society. So we call it Dragonfly Cafe Networking. It's a free space for peer support and networking. And of course, we, we used to have a lot of volunteers and clients coming to us through the Dragonfly Cafe. And as a global consortium, we, of course, uh, perform some sort of a um, some sort of research. Um, it, of course, goes very slow because none of us is full time employed by Dragonfly. So um, it's uh, something we do because each and every time we deliver talk, we collect the data and we analyze the data to make sure that we can, um, you know, um, can um, improve our talks. And see and and use the the quantifiable metrics. So far, in uh, actually, it was also very symbolic. I think this year in academic um, in mental health awareness week for Max Planck, in October we delivered our 200th talk, um, and we have calculated the, that we've managed approximately to reach around 20,000 people, academics, in 18 countries and globally. And because we made sure that we measured the outcome uh we know that um after our mental health literacy about we measured uh, around 75 percent improvement in objective knowledge uh about uh mental health and we do feel we do know that 98 percent of participants felt more prepared after our skills training workshops and 88 percent felt the film uh within our anti-stigma film campaigns um was reduced uh the stigma was reduced um, when it comes to my particular contribution to Dragonfly, um, on top of just um, like running organizational things, I of course was participating in creating programs. So we have programs which we deliver upon request and we started with the mental health literacy talk, which was initially developed and delivered by Wendy. And then we have also upon requests, of course, uh, created programs as in how to organize your peer network or isolation in academic mental health, imposter phenomenon, immigration and academic mental health, and the internal meeting, which is welcome on board meeting. And this one is also quite often we, we run it to make sure that our volunteers, when they come, they're, they are, they're real, they understand what's going on. So all these things were created by me, of course, then then evaluated by the whole community and then was released. But this is something which I contributed uh, to a content creation. Um, I also have been working on um, developing the European direction. And in 2019, um, in Europe, we delivered one talk. And this year, we have delivered more than 50. So this is something which uh, I particularly uh, am involved in. Um, I love organization. I do love organization and process um, optimization. So I did create some uh, things uh, such as executive dashboard, and I'll share it with you now. So I'm take, making sure that our web page is running together with others, of course. Uh, we make sure that there, there are updates. And um, I run ambassador program, uh, which uh, where we train local people in their universities and institutes so they'd know how to deliver the program and they'd be able to deliver these programs um, locally. Uh, process optimization is always an ongoing thing and um, fundraising efforts are ongoing for all of us, for the whole executive team. Um, so far, I have to admit it's not too effective. And um, so this is something which I've been contributing to, developing happily. It is extremely, I am, um, I like what I do. I cannot say I'm passionate about it. I guess my personality traits are the way that I'm not passionate about anything. Uh, but I'm, I'm overall, I, I enjoy it. So however, I would like to share with all of you the financial aspects of this work. Um, not to make an illusion that, um, academic mental health is profitable. So I was doing all the work for free from 2017. And in 2020, I received around 1500 from Dragonfly based on the things we delivered, the talks, and some people managed to pay for it. 
So uh, for talks delivery, I received in 2020, 1500, and in 2021, 2200 euro uh, the whole year. Um, I had a difficult um, emotional mental situation in the beginning, end of 2021 and beginning of 2022. So I was supported financially uh, during my recovery, my primary recovery phase from March to June this year. And because I was in the process of application for a citizenship in Germany, I needed to get some, some reasonable uh, salary. So uh, this was 3,500 3, 3, 3, was the... Um, a minimum sort of a minimum which I needed to get uh, in order to be not be able to kicked out from um, my citizenship application. And as soon as I started to work, so in June I got my citizenship. I also felt uh, better, so I was able to start my my job at Lipotype, which is a strongly like M for um, their their amazing company. I still work part time because I'm not fully recovered. And so till September 2022, I was able to get some partial support from Dragonfly. Uh, but unfortunately, this year, um, the whole crisis, we're not doing very, uh, like, sort of financially well. So at the moment, I don't get any support from Dragonfly. And so again, I moved to a full-on volunteering project. So um, interesting what this whole thing gave me was that I got a couple of really cool interviews being interviewed for uh, really interesting companies and projects I didn't get the jobs eventually somehow however it gave me some new interesting connections and um, this whole experience apparently is valued by people who are recruiting folks for uh, mental health oriented organizations so it did not um, make me financially independent from uh, a daily job. So I do still have to perform day-to-day um, -day scientific oriented sort of uh, things. Um, however, it, it's um, I really am hopeful that at a certain point, um, things will uh, start working for me rather than me working for them. So um, in 2022, only this year, I started to get invited for the talks independently as me, not as a, a Dragonfly ambassador. Of course, I've delivered, I don't know how many talks. However, only this year, um, I started to get recognized. Um, so essentially five years later uh, for my um, activities. Most of the talks I'm invited to give are still not paid. Um, so please be mindful about it. Um, and when it comes to investments, rather than investments into personal brand than being paid, I am at this very moment Googleable. So, like my um, the, the things I perform, so my Twitter, my uh, my my LinkedIn, all the social activities which I perform, some of them or most of them are probably Googleable. So it really works on the um, personal brand rather than financial aspect. Um, I also wanted to show you maybe a couple of things. Um, maybe maybe we already ran out of time. So I think uh, then I'll just uh, show you the slide where with my my information and, uh, and yeah, we can move on to the questions. Thank you so much for a talk that hit hard for me it was I'm really grateful are you okay um, yes okay yeah because like I, I wasn't sure that um you know okay no it's it, it, it's it's I think you delivered something that is really important and I think the financial aspects at the at the end has a lot of value as well um I wanted to be transparent. I am full on for transparency. And since we're talking about inter entrepreneurship, I said to myself, you know what? I need to be honest to people that, you know, it is how it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope you're recovering as well. I am such in such a supportive environment. I cannot be more. I'm every day. I'm waking up and I'm like, thanks God, I'm in Germany. Thanks God. I when the, the this war, this this horrible thing is going on. I'm within the supportive environment. It's um, and again, you know, like 
I'm blooming when I'm in the comfort zone. So I absolutely don't buy the step out of your comfort zone. I'm 34, almost 35. And my whole life, I've been trying to step into my comfort zone. So finally, I'm there and I'm like, I'm actually okay, you know? So like, if you're outside, yeah, make sure you're comfortable. Make sure you like where you wake up every day, you know? Cats really, really understand that. Your cats too, right? Uh, you? <laughs> yeah, cats are always for comfort zones. <laughs> Sh shall I wrap up? Go for okay. it. There is okay. one question that might be relevant, but but that's fine. Let's let's just do that quickly. Um, so, Olya, we had a fantastic question about um, medical and PhD students having to be uh, super organized. At least that's like the assumption. But was that something you actually would agree with? <laughs> uh, what do you mean? Uh, whoever. So it's uh, like, is it like PhD students are typically very organized? I think yeah, that maybe that you have to do both. Um, the fact is it that a question? Medical, like, uh, yes, I guess like, um, would you say that they are genuinely organized or is it just like a folk thing? I'd say that there's all sorts of people and some of them are very organized and some of them are disorganized like like hurricane um <laughs> i do believe that some people who have ocd like myself for example obsessive compulsive disorder uh we do benefit in science from it so we do make sure that all of our labels are the way that we can 10 years later open them and make sure that we understand what's going on and our lab books are like nicely colored and so on academia praises it definitely it benefits from it for sure uh so i see that this maybe is a bit some sort of a self-filtering mechanism could be uh but i've seen all the spectrum um i do not really tolerate massive benches um but some people are happy so i i i don't i don't see any um so this is my view on, on organization. I think we're filtered out by academia some way or another. That makes a lot of sense. All right, we are on time, my friends. Um, we've had this amazing selection of people dropping in and dropping out. Um, so we've actually probably had a lot more people than it looks like at any given time. <laughs> um, and there've been some really personal and amazing stories that we've had so far today. So thank you very much, everyone. This will be uploaded to YouTube. Uh, and we, we will share this in a few days time and thank you so much once again Olya and Jasia and um, Danielle I think she's had to leave but mm -hmm. yeah it's been a really good session yes thank you so much everyone thank you Olya amazing talks by everyone <laughs> have a beautiful Bye. day everyone <laughs>